Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a webinar on understanding bidirectional integration for the Medicaid transformation demonstration. Before we get started, I uh, just want to do some housekeeping to make sure we're all connected. Audio options, uh, if, please use your telephone to dial the number in the audio section of the webinar panel. When prompted, enter your access code and audio PIN. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please submit those in the webinar uh, panel um, and we will be answering questions at the end of today's presentation. Um, so as soon as they come to mind, just send those in. We'll be writing those down and make sure that we have uh, some time at the end to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so my name is Keely Klein and I serve as the manager for Medicaid transformation with the Washington State Healthcare Authority. Today I am joined by several presenters. Jenny Weir, program director for the uh, Dr. Robert Reed Collaborative. Ann Shields, an associate director with the University of Washington Ames Center. Ryan Sandoval, primary care behavioral health program manager with Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. And Joan Miller, senior policy analyst with the Washington Council for Behavioral Health. So the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss bidirectional integration in the context of the Medicaid transformation demonstration. Over the next 90 minutes, we hope to gain a greater understanding of why bidirectional clinical integration is so important. We want to ensure that attendees are aware of the opportunities the Medicaid Transformation Demonstration presents to accelerate and support bidirectional integration efforts. We plan to provide a high-level overview of funds flow and performance measurement within the demonstration, and we will spend a significant portion of the time today discussing the approaches and options for bidirectional integration which are listed in the Medicaid Transformation Project Toolkit. Before we dive in, it's important to remember the larger initiative that this, uh, that this work sits under, and that is Healthier Washington. Essentially, Healthier Washington encompasses all the work happening at HCA and around the state that is transforming the health system to reward high quality care, focus on whole person health, and empower local communities to tackle their local health needs. And with that brief introduction, we're going to discuss bidirectional integration within the context of the demonstration. Um, I'll just take this opportunity to note that there are three major initiatives under the Medicaid transformation demonstration, but for today's webinar, we really are specifically talking about uh, elements of Initiative 1. Initiative 1 is Transformation Through Accountable Communities of Health, which focuses on health improvement projects to transform the Medicaid delivery system, to serve the whole person, and to use resources more wisely. Um, so hopefully those of you listening in today are familiar with the Project Toolkit, which is a key document that guides uh, the Initiative 1 activities that are eligible for incentive funds um, through the Delivery System Reform Incentive Program. This toolkit was developed with state and regional health priorities in mind, including input from cross-sector experts and stakeholders. Um, so for each of the projects listed within the toolkit, there are evidence-based approaches or promising practices. There are pro progress milestones, timelines, and outcome metrics. Um, this uh, graphic here just uh, provides the outline of the Project, uh, projects in the different domains that are described in the toolkit. The red text on this slide highlights required activities for all ACHs. And then as the arrow here indicates, our focus today really is on Project 2A, bidirectional integration of care uh, uh, and primary care. Slide. So if uh, you recall from a few slides ago, a key element of Healthier Washington is a focus on whole person health. The objective of Project 2A supports this goal by addressing physical and behavioral health needs in one system through an integrated network of providers. You will hear the phrase bidirectional integration often today, and what we really mean is integrating behavioral health services into primary care settings and integrating primary care services into behavioral health settings. 
So um, there are nine accountable communities of health across the state. Uh, under the demonstration, ACHs have been tasked with coordinating demonstration activities and will be partnering with a variety of providers to support the development and implementation of transformation projects. Partnering providers may include clinical providers, community-based organizations, county governments, tribal governments, um, among many others. A couple things to note that the project that we'll be discussing today, Project 2A, is mandatory, which means this project will be implemented across the state in all of our accountable community of health regions. Um, the other piece to, to really note here is that um, with many of the projects in the toolkit, there's a list of evidence-based approaches. Project 2A is unique in that there's actually a requirement that each ACH implements two approaches, meaning one approach integrating behavioral health into primary care settings, and at least one approach integrating primary care into the behavioral health setting. Um, there's a lot more information on these approaches um, and milestones in the toolkit, which is available on our Medicaid transformation website. Um, the other thing that I'd add is while the toolkit has a lot more detail than what we will cover today, the toolkit is also just not going to include all of the details um, to capture the work that's necessary to achieve clinical integration. But it's really designed to list the milestones that will be reported as well as the outcome metrics that must be achieved in order to trigger incentive payments um, through the Delivery System Reform Incentives Program. Another um, bit of information just to provide some uh, foundation and, and some context is that ACHs are currently working on submission of their project plan these project plans are due November 16th of this year. Project plans are, um, there's a template available and they, it is broken into two sections. The first is really focused on the ACH organization and then the second section is focused on the projects that will be implemented um, over the next few years. These plans must be developed in collaboration with community partners. They should be responsive to community specific needs and and certainly advance the objectives of the demonstration. To be eligible to receive incentive funds under the demonstration, these project plans must receive approval, um, first through the independent assessor and then ultimately by the healthcare authority. So again, in these project plans, so for project 2A and all other selected projects, these plans will include details for expected project outcomes, anticipated scope, implementation approach and timing, and a preliminary list of partnering pr providers that have committed to the work uh, for the selected project. And again, just wanting to provide a, a little bit more um, context and foundation for those who um, may be newer to this information and uh, having dove into some of the resources um, available on the website. Um, this is a incentive program. This is not a grant. Um, so there's some ways in which incentive payments are earned. When we say ACHs, we are referring to how the ACH as a collective of their partnering providers participating in projects can be eligi eligible to earn incentive payments. Um, that said, how the money flows from the state to the ACH may not necessarily be the same as how funds flow to those partnering providers. This slide here is intended to provide some of the detail on the types of milestones and metrics that will trigger incentives. Uh, An ACH will determine um, through their budget plans how to distribute earned incentives to their partnering providers. Um, so again, this is an incentive program, not a grant, which means that uh, ACHs earn dollars by demonstrating completion of project milestones, reporting on project implementation status, and demonstrating progress toward improvement targets for project metrics over the five-year demonstration period. So when we talk about the pay for reporting um, milestones, that are seen here on the lighter blue box on the left at the top of the slide. 
Um, these are uh, reporting incentives that are earned by the ACHs twice a year, um, beginning next year, based on submission of a semi-annual report that includes information on regional achievement of progress milestones um, and other information related to project implementation status. And then as we um, move along over the course of the demonstration, uh, we have paper performance project measures which are assessed on an annual basis and are calculated for the entire ACH region based on um, beneficiary address, uh, regardless of the scope of project activities or uh, partnering providers. ACHs will have a performance goal for each of these paper performance metrics called an improvement target. These ACH will have their own um, baseline starting point and it will be re reset for each performance year. Improvement targets are set based on one of two methods and these are a gap to blow method which, is a, which assesses a region's progress towards closing the gap between their baseline starting point and a national performance benchmark identified by the state. The second um, method is what we call improvement over self, where performance is assessed based on how much a region improves from their baseline performance. There is a, this is a lot of information. Um, there's uh, additional resources available on our website and even more information will be forthcoming over the coming months as we continue to work through a um, measurement guide which will provide a lot more detail as to how, how both of these um, methodologies and the paper performance work. Um, and then again, you can get a lot more of the paper reporting information um, right from the toolkit. The next slide. So this here is a sample um, of some of the progress milestones and the project metrics for Project 2A specifically. So if you see those um, on the left of the are broken out into different stages to reflect um, time, timing of uh, when these milestones should be reported on. Um, there's, again, more information and a more com comprehensive list within the toolkit. Um, milestones transition from those indicating progress towards planning and implementation of project activities to milestones that demonstrate efforts to scale and sustain those successful project strategies. If you look to the right, uh, on the right hand side of this slide for the paper performance metrics, these are really activated beginning in year three of the demonstra demonstration, so that would be um, 2019. Um, and these are, again, uh, based on um, uh, annual assessment of data by the healthcare authority. Um, and evaluated for ACH regional performance. Um, I think it's important to note here that provider level results are not a part of the framework to initially earn those project incentive dollars from the state. Um, so when we determine whether or not the ACH has hit the, hit the targets, uh, we really are looking at the data that's reflective of, of the ACH region, um, not going to the specific partnering provider level. Um, another point to emphasize is that it's the state's responsibility to produce all of the pay for performance metrics um, and uh, as such is committed to ensuring a measurement program that is uh, both robust and transparent. Um, the toolkit metrics um, were selected to ensure applicability to project objectives. Um, as well as uh, relevancy to evidence-based approaches based on input from um, partners and stakeholders. Um, we had, when we were also uh, selecting those metrics, uh, we prioritized those um, where there was alignment with our existing managed care contracts, as well as those from the statewide common measure set. Um, and again, just reinforcing that this is just a, a sample of the um, progress milestones and project metrics um, and to review the toolkit for the more comprehensive list. And before um, we transition to go a bit deeper into integrated care um, and the different approaches, 
I just wanted to highlight um, that we recognize that achieving clinical integration takes significant resources and effort. And really, the incentives earned through the demonstration are intended to support the necessary infrastructure and capabilities. So for those of you who are joining us today and are not already actively involved um, with your accountable community of health, we'll have some resource slides at the end of today's presentation that will um, give you a bit more information on how to get involved. So with that, I'm now going to transition over to Jenny Weir um, to walk us through some slides on the free collaborative. Okay, hi. Uh, this is Ginny Weir. I'm the program director of the Brie Collaborative. Um, and I, my goal here is to really just give a general idea of what our collaborative is, why we're involved with our behavioral health integration, and, and to really talk about how Project 2A builds from this work uh, that we did to develop standards around integration. Um, so uh, the Brie Collaborative is really charged with finding specific ways to improve healthcare quality, outcomes, and affordability in our state. And we're named after Dr. Robert Brie, who was a radiologist at Harborview and was part of some earlier work around high utilization of advanced imaging. So we are a, a bottom-up community-based quality improvement collaborative. Next slide. We were created by our state legislature in 2011 through House Bill 1311, and it really called for uh, our governor-appointed members to represent healthcare stakeholders, including hospitals, health systems, health insurance plans, um, public healthcare purchasers for the state of Washington, as well as private healthcare purchasers or employers, so Boeing and King County, physicians and quality improvement organizations. And we select uh, about three or four healthcare services uh, with high utilization, high variation, um, that are frequently used without producing better care outcomes or really that have patient safety issues that our members are concerned about. Next slide. And the way that we work after choosing a topic is to form a work group or clinical committee that's made up of experts in this topic that involves patients, that involves health plans, and really develop evidence-based recommendations around the topic. So these work groups will meet for about nine months to a year. We consider quality improvement programs, best practices among hospitals and medical groups in our state and other states specialty society guidelines, literature reviews, uh, and other ways to really impact care like financial incentives or data transparency. So after a public comment period, we'll present our recommendations back to BREE members, gain approval, and then submit our recommendations to the healthcare authority. And they're really our main implementation pathway through healthcare authority contracting. And we also work to set a community standard uh, with our recommendations, but we don't have the authority to mandate adoption. Next slide. So this is a, a list of our previous work. We started um, working on obstetrics, looking at C-sections, and we've worked on a variety of topics since then. Uh, and you'll see behavioral health integration in the corner, uh, which I'll talk about today. Next slide. So our members really recognized the separation of behavioral and physical health uh, is a problem for our community uh, and really a missed opportunity uh, due to high unmet need. So we convened a work group of experts uh, that met from April 2016 to March 2017. We had many hours of robust conversation uh, and really settled on the need for an overarching definition of behavioral health integration that could really bridge different models and, and serve as a way, uh, it's kind of a you know it when you see it sort of model. So you can see the list of members, some of whom will be speaking on this webinar as well on the slide there. Next slide. So we landed on this definition for integrated care, and I think the most important thing about our work is, again, that it's model agnostic. So we focused on uh, really team-based care uh, provided to um, families, to patients, to caregivers that's focused on the whole person um, and includes um, primary care, behavioral health, uh, and really other care team members working together to address what matters to patients. Next slide. 
And then we developed these eight elements that you'll see here, and I'll go into more detail about each of these. And we base these off national and local work to define a working model for integration. So this is based off the chronic care model, patient-centered medical home, the AIM Center, collaborative care model, primary care behavioral health, and others uh, in our state and around the country. So our elements are meant to be pragmatic, uh, they're based in evidence, um, and they're built by our community. And most of all, they're really meant to be useful uh, to the community. Next slide. So when we talked about our elements, I think it was really helpful to sort of base this in the patient's perspective. So our first one is focused on the integrated care team. And for a patient, we really define this as, I can see how my care team takes my concerns into consideration when making treatment decisions. And I can talk to members of my care team about any of my concerns, including feeling low or depressed, concerns about drinking, and I know that my team will be able to answer my questions and help get me treatment if I choose to. So this really means that every member of the team has clearly defined roles for both physical and behavioral health care services. Team members really understand their roles and that they participate in typical practice activities, either in person or virtually. So that's team meetings, daily models, pre-visit planning, other quality improvement work. Next slide. Uh, so number two, patient access to behavioral health as a routine part of care. From the patient perspective, this means uh, that I'm really offered the option to have an in-person visit, speak to a behavioral health care provider during my primary care visit, or have a follow-up phone call from a member of the integrated care team um, that I can elect to receive services in person, by phone, or some other mechanism that's really most convenient for me. Um, and so operationally, we really mean this to be um, behavioral health and primary care services are available on the same day as much as feasible. Again, these are really meant to be pragmatic while, while focused on meeting patient needs. So at a minimum, um, we want a plan to be developed on the same day that includes continuous patient engagement in ways that are convenient for patients. So that's in person or by phone. Next slide. Number three uh, is, is really on patient information so that providers can um, get access to that information and share it across sites if that's the, the model that's being used. So from the patient perspective, this means um, I have access to my own care plan if I wanna see it. When I call the practice, um, they always know who I am. They know what my needs are. My healthcare team communicates well. They have access to my information. And it feels like everyone's really on the same page about my health goals. Um, so this is the, the integrated care team having access to actionable medical and behavioral health information via a shared care plan, really at the point of care. And that clinicians are working together um, through regularly scheduled consultation and coordination to jointly address a patient's shared care plan. Next slide. So number four is that the practice has access to psychiatric services. Um, from the patient, this means the, the integrated care team is able to consult with specialists to make sure that my treatment is going to help me. And then if I need higher levels of care, I'm really able to see a specialist directly as I, I need it. Um, so for the practice, this means uh, access to psychiatric consultation available in a systematic manner to assist the care team in developing a treatment plan and adjusting treatments for patients who are not improving under that originally expected uh, plan. And then for patients with more severe or complex systems, uh, symptoms and diagnoses, that specialty care is available and that it's really well coordinated with primary care. And that, that coordination piece, of course, is a recurring theme in, in our definition for integrated care. Next slide. So this focuses on the operational systems and workflows to really support population-based care. So from the patient's perspective, um, I'm asked about my behavioral health concerns at my first visit and at least annually thereafter. If a screening result uh, suggests that I might have a behavioral health concern or a screen positive for something like depression or alcohol use, I'm introduced to somebody on the care team that is trained to help me and really that I receive the type of treatment that's best suited for me. 
So from the practice perspective, this is really meant to be a structured method of being in place for proactive identification and stratification of patients for targeted conditions. So that the practice uses uh, the systematic clinical protocols based on screening results and other patient data like uh, emergency room use that really help to characterize patient risk uh, and the complexity of patient needs. Um, also that practices really track patients with target conditions to make sure that the patient is engaged and treated to target. Uh, and there is a proactive follow-up plan to assess improvement and really adapt to treatment accordingly. Next slide. So here we talk about our evidence-based uh, treatments. Um, so really that uh, treatments are appropriate for patients, that the, the patient's needs are being met, that uh, language is being used that it's understandable to the patient and culturally and religiously appropriate, um, that the practice is using uh, appropriate uh, systems for the, the needs of the individual practice setting, and that the patient's goals of care are really incorporated into um, the, the conversations that are happening. Next slide. Uh, and number seven is really the patient involvement uh, in care, that providers are really talking to the patient about what integrated care means, um, that they've asked patients about uh, their opinions about access and quality, and uh, even asking about social support needs. Um, and really, again, we'll reiterate this in multiple of our elements, that patient goals of care inform the care plan and that communication is um, happening effectively uh, and, and at a level that meets the patient's needs. Next slide. So our last element uh, is focused on data for quality improvement. Um, so from the patient's perspective, this might look like the practice asking for my feedback about my experience at the clinic. Um, that we're really frequently asking uh, and reassessing my health goals together, so the, the practice and the patient, to see how I'm improving and where I might need support or advice. And it really just feels like the practice is getting better at serving my needs. And then from the, the practice level, um, there's system level data regarding access to behavioral care, uh, patient experience, and, and the patient outcomes are being tracked. And if system goals are not being met, so there are quality improvement efforts um, being employed to achieve patient access goals and outcome standards. Next slide. So this is just a sample of uh, the roadmap that we developed that was really meant to help walk um, practices through what we mean uh, what in integrated care. And so we have our usual care, our steps toward integration and our integrated care mapped onto the, the patient perspective for each of our eight elements. Um, so I really encourage everybody to look at our report. It's available on our Brie Collaborative website. And of course, I'm available to answer questions at the end of the webinar too. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Jenny. This is Ann Shields. I'm with the AIM Center, and um, joining me is Brian Sandoval from Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. And we're going to walk through uh, some slides and ideas and concepts around a stepped approach to integrating behavioral health care into primary care. Next slide. Uh, here's a pyramid that uh, Brian and I have used to talk about uh, how different strategies and uh, models might fit together. Um, again, this is, I like Jenny's term, model agnostic. Um, we're gonna talk mostly right now about this middle band, the navy blue band, about what happens in primary care, where primary care provider is often the first line of, first line intervener with uh, any patients with depression, moderate or more severe mental illness. Obviously, there are many patients that are um, seen more frequently in a behavioral health agency who might be best served there. Um, but often this is our first line of action within primary care. And often uh, we're lucky enough, many practices in our state have been lucky enough to have a behavioral health consultant in a, or a, what's sometimes called a PCBH model. So, Brian? 
Yeah, I think so. As, as Ann said, I think the goal is really to find a way to integrate a number of, of concepts. And, and Jenny alluded to this um, in the Re Collaborative, which is um, we're really, if we're really going to take a, a, an approach to behavioral health care, specifically in primary care that is um, really integrated with care, uh, we really need to think about um, a system that allows for. Um, I guess both what you would think of as kind of what we can call a, a horizontal integration or a take all comers uh, model and then um, there and then you know a collaborative care type of model where we're really looking at um, more of a focused population approach and I think ultimately the goal is to create something like that in primary care so that uh, we can provide treatment to a, a lot of individuals, ideally, and at the same time, um, do a really good job of uh, making sure that we're following up um, with um, individuals who need a higher level of care and particularly a, a very um, uh, focused multidisciplinary approach that we're doing that in a systematic way. So um, really what we've created here, rather than talk about the individual models, is really a, a concept of trying to bring two separate, um, what if sometimes been thought of as completely different approaches into a more um, integrated behavioral system approach. And uh, I just want to point out that some of our best practices in Washington State, we have many health systems that combine both a behavioral health consultant role with the, in, within the context of uh, a stepped, more intensive care program, um, a collaborative care model. Uh, so. Uh, the Franciscans, Community Health Centers, Providence Regions, Polyclinic, we have lots of great examples of how these work together um, and so that there's no wrong direction here um, and there's no clear choice that has to be made for it within the ACHs about which model to move forward on. I just want to point out, um, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide here, uh, is that um, there are also uh, these models also adapt to rural areas um, where you might have a much smaller primary care team, and I'll have a slide about that a little bit later. Again, uh, this whole concept of models versus principles, um, no one model or uh, model of care or approach is going to fit all. We're ex arguing about the best integration model. It's a little bit like arguing about the best religion. Now, the Medicaid demonstration project is not asking you to make that choice. Um, it's asking you to look at the common principles um, from the BERI collaborative work group, as well as the collaborative care strategy. Um, and so if you're adopting measurement-based strategies, you're treating the target, as Jenny said, you're on the right track. You have room to develop your model and refine your models over the next few years. Um, and get ready for value-based purchasing. Next slide. Brian? Yep, so, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, I think one of the things that, and I realize there's a very broad audience here on the call, uh, but it's really important to talk about when you begin to think about selecting models of care, and, and I shouldn't say use models, I think more effectively, I, I would say approaches to care, you really want to think about um, how these relate to um, all the way back to the Medicaid Project Toolkit. Uh, I think that there are um, a lot of populations and subpopulations that um, we're responsible for in terms of, of showing outcomes. Um, one of the things that um, we find ac across projects is, is ED utilization in particular becomes um, a focus group um, across ACHs, across health systems. And so I guess what I'm saying is um, when you begin to construct your integration approach, if you're simply focusing on models um, and, and creating systems without, um, without thinking about where you're really going to achieve the outcomes, I think you're going to be missing the boat. I think a lot of what we want to think about is um, thinking more than just treating one specific disease state, but more or less thinking about ways to impact metrics in a way that's going to be meaningful across the ACH system. So, next slide. So, so start with the end in mind. Um, think about what you 
what you need to do and, and, and go from there. Um, really, uh, we have this, so this is again pulled directly from the toolkit. Um, I think what, what is, it tends to be a misnomer here is that, um, that you have to choose like one or two or, um, and you've got it kind of split up into integrating behavioral health into primary care settings, again, from the toolkit, or again, integrating primary care into behavioral health settings. Um, I, I think the way it's organized sometimes can be misleading in that um, sometimes people feel like, well, I have to choose one of these or two of these. Um, and in reality, the, the goal is really to, to work in building all of them. Um, and so uh, I think the idea of this slide is really to remember that um, as you begin to think about um, where you want to go and achieve uh, outcomes and metrics from a, a system standpoint, an ACH standpoint, and even a clinic standpoint that's connected to an ACH, you want to begin to think about how your approach integrates into the other approaches across the health system. Uh, and, and very likely it's a combination of all of these approaches. Next slide. So that reference is a good segue to what we like to think about as sort of the common principles of both the Brie elements and uh, the collaborative care strategies that are outlined in the Medicaid toolkit. So you'll hear, see here on the left-hand side the Brie elements. Um, I won't go into these in detail. Jenny described all of them very nicely earlier. But when you line those elements up against the principles and key aspects of the collaborative care model, you see that really you can't go wrong. <laughs> They're both leading you in the same direction. They're leading you towards a stronger measurement-based system of care, looking towards more systematic screening, um, and uh, a treatment-to-target approach um, that's going to be able to really capture and serve your patient population with the right level of intensity. Not everyone needs to be enrolled in a collaborative care program to get better. Not everyone... Um, needs to see any member of a behavioral health team to get better necessarily. So there's lots of strategies here. And so uh, if you, uh, the specs um, are outlined um, here in the parentheses in my first column, and those relate back to what Jenny also described earlier. So um, this is frankly, I think, the most important slide I contributed today um, to just help everyone realize there's no false choice to be made here on keeping common principles in mind will help you plan your models that are going to work best um, for your communities and geographic areas. Next slide. So, so I want to basically, there's a lot of information that's being presented and I know webinars are tough to get information and I'm willing to bet a lot of your probably even multitasking and doing other things, but I think these last couple slides are really important to, to, to think about. I think ultimately at the end of the day, when we're really trying to construct um, a system of behavioral health care, um, there, there's some important things to take into mind and starting to work at the community, the ACH level, and your own clinic level. Um, you know, these types of things that are on the slide right now, um, the care plans, the exit to psychiatry, screening identification and stratification, system tracking and follow-up and quality improvement. I think these are really kind of the, the, the take-home things that you want to begin to think about as, as a part of your process. And I think if you really look at the Brie Collaborative, which again consolidates um, the models, it, the idea is really focused in on, on these pieces. And I think the thing that is, is also extremely important is um, when you begin to start doing tracking and identification and stratification, make sure that the subpopulation you're working on um, is consistent with the populations that are being studied and tracked um, at the ACH level, because there's going to be financial incentives attached to that. Um, and I know traditionally um, collaborative care has, has focused on, um, there's a lot of practices in collaborative care that are focusing on depression. Um, and I know that there are studies that collaborative care has done outside of depression and I think, um, and have had success. And I think one of the things I would challenge practices to do is number one, think um, depression and um, other things. Uh, and at the same time, begin to build in and think about a system that, that also treats all comers. Uh, and in doing that, I think that's going to be your best way to accomplish all of these things. Oh, 
Oh, next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. I wanted to uh, wanted to make sure we um, touched upon how telemedicine-based strategies for integration might work. Um, these strategies might be particularly important in rural Washington counties, and also really in any area where uh, behavioral health workforce shortages exist. Uh, so it's really important. So just to define what telemedicine-based services include, they may include limited in-person interactions, but most interventions are provided um, um, through phone or other virtual connections, um, video, or, but mostly by phone. These strategies are not just being adopted by rural areas, but actually some other large health organizations, such as Kaiser Permanente, have been very successful with these strategies. Um, Same-day access is less feasible, might be challenging. There might be just a follow-up phone call. But um, in reality, what we see are the outcomes for these uh, strategies are very good. Um, well, there's eight published trials with positive results. Four of those trials were exclusively off-site care managers um, and uh, supported by psychologists and psychiatrists that are completely off-site in very rural parts of Arkansas. Uh, we're working with rural providers in Washington, Montana, Northern California to develop these strategies. I welcome any questions you might have have about these ideas. Okay. Uh, next slide. I think this is Brian's and my final slide as well. Um, just to step back, your training strategies for Project 2A. Uh, we really encourage that you think about your workforce challenges up front. Uh, behavioral health providers uh, might include staff that you might not think about in these roles. We're, we have some expanded roles developing for nurses and pharmacists in this arena. Um, really expect your local provider's readiness for training to potentially happen at different times and happen over time. So our strategy at the AIMS Center, which has evolved particularly when I work in New York State, which also is um, is probably two years out in front of us in their own Medicaid transformation work, is uh, developing smaller learning groups that can move forward more nimbly when each provider is ready, i.e. has their staff hired, has their plan together, has their, their billing and sustainability plan in place. Those smaller practice groups can often inform and be parts of a larger IHI-style IHI style learning collaborative in a useful way. Uh, but do expect that your providers will move forward at potentially at different speed and at different times. So you'll have to plan around that um, over time. Expect variation. Your providers all have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, they're going to adapt these integration strategies to fit needs and particular circumstances in, in, in different ways. So that's why the principles are so important. Uh, and above all, don't get hung up on choosing a model or enforcing a particular model. Um, that's going to, that's going to get, <laughs> that's really not how healthcare improves very well. We often use quality improvement methods such as plan, do, steady, act cycles, cycles, PDSA. Uh, uh, at the AIM Center, we're big believers in enlightened trial and error, PDSAs. And that's going to get you farther in the long haul than um, too much top-down um, model planning. So thanks. We'll turn it back over to the next presenter, Joan. Hi, everyone. I'm Joan Miller. I am a senior policy analyst with the Washington Council for Behavioral Health. Um, can we switch to the next slide, actually? Thanks. Um, so I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk with all of you about the other half of bidirectional integration. There has been a lot of focus on integrating behavioral health into the primary care setting, and appropriately so, appropriately so because it's where so many people are served. But there is integration being done and being done successfully in the behavioral health setting, and we do need both halves if we're really going to achieve that whole person care that we've been talking about. So before I get into some principles and approaches, I want to start by spending a little time talking about who is the population that's being served in community behavioral health. Next slide, please. So 
So this population are people who are living with a serious and persistent mental illness and or a substance use disorder. There have been decades of research demonstrating the health disparities within this population. And first and foremost, they have a reduced life expectancy due to physical conditions that are in fact um, preventable. There was a study published almost two years ago now in the journal for the American Medical Association that found people with schizophrenia lose on average of 27 years of life to conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure. Physical conditions that could easily be screened for in the behavioral health setting if we're able to transform the way that we deliver care. And then relatedly, this population, um, they often have multiple chronic physical conditions. And in fact, when you're talking about Medicaid beneficiaries with a serious mental illness, they are two to three times more likely to also have a chronic physical condition. So in my mind, these data really require us to begin a systemic shift away from episodic acute care or addressing just presenting symptoms so we can really begin focusing on whole person care. And then a few other um, health disparities that are found in the SMI population are inadequate access to or inadequate care in the primary setting, which I will talk a little bit more about in the next slide. And then there's also the related problem of diagnostic overshadowing. Many times people with a psychiatric diagnosis, they don't um, always get the screening or the preventative care necessary for some of their physical health symptoms. And then finally, I think it's important for all of us to recognize that this population affects other health systems. It makes up a disproportionate share of the 550 population, that 5% of um, Medicaid enrollees who account for at least 50% of expenditures. This is one of the most expensive populations to treat, and it's also where you can find significant cost savings. Next slide, please. So I think the next question to consider when determining an approach to bidirectional integration is to decide where an individual should be served. I think a good rule of thumb for everyone, not just those working with you know, someone with a serious mental illness or substance abuse disorder, is to consider that integrated services should be offered by the provider who knows the patient best. Um, Dr. Joe Parks, who is Missouri's former Medicaid director always likes to remind people that patients are most likely to change their health-related behaviors in response to a frequently recurring face-to-face -face relationship. And to be perfectly frank, people living with a serious mental illness or substance use disorder have tremendous barriers to receiving effective care in a primary care setting, which you know, prevents them from establishing that face-to-face -face relationship. And so just briefly, I'll mention a couple of those barriers um, just to give you an idea. Um, first, primary care visits are really too short to effectively engage with or provide care for someone living with a serious mental illness, particularly if it's a thought disorder. 15 minutes just isn't enough time. Um, and then secondly, these patients with these conditions often exhibit challenging or disruptive behaviors. Um, that aren't necessarily welcome in a primary care setting. That being said, of course, I think we should also recognize that the appropriate setting isn't always permanent and it's going to ebb and flow based on the type of care and level of care an individual needs. Um, I really like the step care pyramid that Anne and Brian referenced just a few moments ago. Um, I think it's a really useful illustration for differentiating between the different levels of care. But I want to stress that not, not everyone enters care at the bottom of that pyramid or in the primary care setting. Um, a primary care provider simply doesn't always provide that first line of treatment, which is why the project toolkit is requiring both sides, both approaches to bidirectional integration. If we have a patient that first begins care in specialty behavioral health, you know, our goal, our hope is that he or she will become well enough um, to be served adequately in primary care. The goal for all of us is to make sure that our patients, all of their needs are being addressed in the most appropriate setting. 
And then finally, um, I did include some data from the state of Missouri, which implemented a health home model in both settings, both in community behavioral health ag agencies and in primary care. And in that state, the savings um, that were realized in the behavioral health based health homes were almost double what was saved in primary care. Um, because again, we're talking about that 550 population that is driving so much of Medicaid expenditures. Next slide. And so another consideration I think relevant to determining which setting is most appropriate is what other supports does the patient need? People living with SMI or um, a substance use disorder often need other services besides medical treatment and therapy to provide stability in their lives and improve their health and really to just help them get well. Um, this slide here shows a full range of services provided in community behavioral health, things like supportive housing, peer support, crisis, um, support for family members, but I just want to take a minute to focus on the last bullet point, which is outreach and engagement. This population does not show up to primary care, and you know, oftentimes they don't show up in behavioral health settings either. Um, many times, of course, that behavior can be attributed to their psychiatric diagnosis, um, but generally primary care providers wait for patients to come to them or they wait for a referral. Whereas in community behavioral health, we are committed to this additional component of outreach engage and engagement to finding people who are not yet engaged in services, but who do actually need them. And so that's just one example of the way in which someone could receive their first line of treatment outside of primary care. Next slide. And so now moving into some strategies and models for bidirectional integration. Um, in this slide, I really just wanted to lay out um, both components on the primary care setting and the behavioral health setting side so you can see, you know, really how similar these approaches and strategies are. Um, many of those collaborative care principles are incorporated into this behavioral health approach either. You have a primary care consultant as part of that multidisciplinary care team. There is a systematic approach for screening for common physical health issues. It's measurement-based. There are um, RN care managers, and you have a primary care consultant doing case reviews. Next slide. And then I will also um, provide the same mantra that Ann and Brian did, to not get hung up on the model. Um, there's no correct way to do this or right way to integrate primary care into a behavioral health setting. Um, there are you know, principles that I think um, would be helpful to include, things like providing patient choice, um, building on local and community resources that are already available to you. Most importantly, establishing formal communication pathways and an opportunity for team meetings, which I'll talk about a little bit next. And then to think about using different mechanisms for collaborating between behavioral health and a primary care setting, which could include things like directly hiring staff or co-locating staff from a partner agency um, or developing a shared care plan. Next slide. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the three approaches described in the project toolkit for integrating primary care into behavioral health. Integration does not have to mean co-location, and in fact, you'll see on this slide that co-location by itself is not an approach endorsed by the toolkit. It's really that collaboration piece and that measurement piece that is most important, particularly when you're first getting started. Um, I recently went on a site visit a couple of weeks ago to one of our member agencies and its CEO was telling me that they had had primary care co-located in their behavioral health agency for ages, but the providers never really talked to each other. And it wasn't until they actively changed how they communicated, how they collaborated 
with each other, that was when they began to see a real difference in the care that was being provided to patients. So again, co-location isn't the be-all, end-all goal of all the models. Um, for example, one option is off-site enhanced collaboration. And this is an approach that moves beyond simply making referrals to primary care. Um, instead, providers would have regular contact with each other. There would be some agreement in place for information sharing. There would be a use of care managers to track physical health outcomes and to facilitate communications among treatment settings. And then the models related to co-location, as you can see, they require more than just being in the same building. Um, the co-located enhanced collaboration, <clears throat> that's an approach where primary care providers and behavioral health providers work in the same location, but they're still relying on care managers to help them communicate, and they're using separate treatment planning and records. When you get into that third approach, things become even more integrated with that team-based care, and you have um, on-site primary care, either limited or full scope, so you have people providing routine physical health screenings. There are multiple levels of health practitioners working within the agency that are able to work within their scope of practice. So there are different approaches um, that could be developed for both sides of bidirectional integration, and you know the principles surrounding them are pretty much the same for both. And that was my last slide. I think I have some resources up next that I'm happy to talk about as well. So um, this is Kaylee. I'll just jump in quickly. Um, so the next several um, slides are resources um, for a lot of the information that has been provided um, throughout the webinar today. Um, these slides will be available um, on our website as well as a recording of this um, of today's presentation. So don't don't feel like you have to try to quickly write down all the URLs here. Um, you can access all of these resource slides um, uh, sometime this week once the slides get posted. Um, I do want to just take um, a quick moment to um, thank the practice trans transformation support hub for their role in coordinating um, and supporting today's presentation. Um, they, uh, without them, this uh, presentation would not have happened, um, and they really brought together um, a great set of panelists. So again, just wanted to thank um, the support of the Practice Transformation Support Hub. Um, as a reminder, if you have questions, please use the um, the chat box to send those. Um, we do have about 30 minutes remaining um, for, for some Q&A um, with all of those who has presented today. We have a few questions we can get started on, um, but please send any additional follow-up questions now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, Anne, if you can, um, we have a question that uh, one commenter asked that they had noticed the common overlap between um, the Breed Collaborative and AIMS uh, Center, but how uh, would you uh, differentiate between the two? Well, really the, the core difference between the two is how psychiatric services are used. Both, Bree, both the Breed Standards and Collaborative Care uh, strategies incorporate or require that you incorporate access to psychiatry services. Um, in a collaborative care strategy, you would, frankly, you'd require your psychiatrist to work differently. Um, so they would be part of a case review process that's usually weekly, operationalized weekly, um, where they are working with a behavioral health provider. Um, on site or virtual um, to review everyone on the collaborative care caseload, i.e., everyone who needs more intensive services in order to get well, get better, get stable, um, and make any recommendations to the primary care provider. 
um, about changes in treatment or adjustments to treatment. So that's really what we mean when we say treatment to target. So that psychiatric case review is uh, what really distinguishes a collaborative care strategy. Um, there's a variety of other strategies that fit nicely with that. Um, telemedicine, direct psychiatry, virtual tele, all of those can be part of that. Um, so again, it's not an either or choice. Most of the psychiatrists that we work with in the community clinics and elsewhere um, who provide um, both collaborative care case review support to primary care teams, they also provide other kinds of services. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm just going to add, if you want to get the most value for your dollar out of a psychiatrist, try that. <laughs> collaborative <laughs> care holds them accountable for an entire population. Whether it's a psych ARNP or a, a psychiatrist, you're, you're going to be holding them accountable for everyone in treatment within the clinic, not just uh, the few patients they have time to see directly. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question, perhaps we can see if Ann or Brian want to start and then any other presenter who wants to jump in. Um, we had a question about the type of providers that might be a good fit for, for the models discussed today, or rather how these models could be applied to various provider types. Brian, you want to go first? Can you, can you repeat that again? I, I had, there was, was breaking up on my end. Can you please, please repeat the question? Yeah, so just a question about the type of providers that would be a good fit for the models um, the integrated care models that we discussed, or how these models could be applied to various provider types. So again, I would get away from models and think about approach. So think about your goal in mind in terms of, um, I think the most important thing is first to think about your approach. Think about how each individual in that approach can best work at the top of their license. And then for those other individuals that are participating in the approach, um, think about how you kind of, you have other people, other disciplines uh, work towards that end. So for example, you know, I think the ideal approach in primary care, at least, is to have, again, a, a take all comers consultation approach um, combined with a care management strategy for more intensive need populations. I think one <clears throat> one without the other uh, is really going to be missing the boat. Um, and so where I'm going with that is for people that can only provide direct service care in terms of the consultation model, you need somebody that's independently licensed. So um, at, at our organization, we employ psychologists. Um, you can also em uh, employ um, licensed mental health counselors, um, clinically oriented social workers. Um, th those are important things that can only be done at that license. But I think when you begin to think about care management, um, you want to think about who can do that work. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be fully licensed people. I know there are some restrictions um, in the collaborative care model. And maybe, Ann, you can speak to that a little bit more around who can do that work. But I, I do see that uh, it is opening up overall. Um, and I also want to make a point that um, if you can, do um, a good job with continuity of care. Um, so if the people are seeing individuals, and this is to Joan's point, if, if, if there are individuals that are being seen by one provider and called by another, um, you know, sometimes that's a little bit more challenging in care management. Um, so if there is some continuity of care there, um, while I am saying that you want to delegate tasks, if there's a way to embed it into uh, a day-to-day -day activities for someone providing the care, I think that's the best approach. Okay, uh, this is Ann. I'll just add that um, uh, I, you know there aren't really restrictions in collaborative care. Uh, there, there are some restrictions in um, who might be willing to pay for collaborative care and what licensures they might be looking at. We actually like to use the term behavioral health provider. Uh, we see many of uh, registered nurses successful in this role. Um, and uh, particularly working across uh, medical comorbidities as well as behavioral health, social workers, RN, psychologists. Uh, you know, there's a, a range of folks that can be very successful in these roles. Um, when, if you're 
are working with uh, uh, less experienced staff, uh, non-licensed staff. They're going to need more support. They're going to need uh, a licensed a provider that they can really turn to for consultation and support. But in very rural clinics, we've seen them be successful in these roles. Great. Thank you. So, Ann, I might stick with you for just one more question. Um, any thoughts on, um, that you could offer on how you could see a collaborative care model being implement, implemented in the emergency department? Oh, good question. Um, and, <laughs> um, uh, you got me a little stumped. I do think that the start of a, uh, a, an ongoing treatment program ongoing treatment could start in an emergency room, especially if, you're, if your emergency department is um, well tied in and connected to um, a primary care resource. Typically, patients spend anywhere from three to six months in a collaborative care program before they graduate or they really don't need to be there any longer. Um, so I think having a real close connection between um, uh, those who present in the emergency department who clearly might, who are found to have some um, behavioral health needs. Um, I think there's lots of ways we could build a strong connection there to an ex uh, existing collaborative care program, but not a short answer. So happy to discuss with whoever asked that offline if, if they'd like to consider how to build that. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, Jenny, I have some questions uh, that hopefully you can help answer. Um, so this first question is about um, same-day access um, uh, that was proposed in Oregon. Um, the question is, if same-day access is a goal for all other patients of a primary care clinic, why would it not be for patients with a behavioral health diagnosis? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And our, our work group has spent a significant amount of time sort of going back and forth debating whether we wanted to include that as a requirement. I will say that we kind of ended up with uh, elements that were more approachable for the wide variety of practices that we know exist in Washington State. And we wanted everybody to um, be able to see our model as, as one that is approachable and um, one that they can attain. And so that's why the decision was made to kind of walk back from fully requiring same day access. And I, I welcome input from um, Brian or Ann, who are there at all the conversations too. So, so this is Brian. I can I can speak a little bit to same day access, and I think I think if we were in an ideal world, I think that same day access is is an optimal goal. I think part of part of the challenge with the Bree Collaborative and trying to consolidate a variety of models and approaches was that we thought requiring that, especially on the rural side of things, might be a little challenging. Although I, I think that we're starting to see more telemedicine options come to fruition that actually, and we're going to be piloting this internally for some same day uh, telemedicine options. And you have, of course, MD Live and other strategies that are out there. Uh, and we're looking at some internal approaches. Because um, what we do find is um, that, you know, the engagement with patients, there's a lot of people um, without say, day, same day access that don't engage in care. Um, and those are also a lot of the, the most vulnerable patients uh, at the same time. So um, the more we can try to move towards same-day access in terms of an engagement tool, um, I think the better off our system will be because of the stigma that's out there. And um, at the same time, I, we thought, I think, to, to, you know, to get back to the question why it wasn't included um, was that it might have been a little bit aggressive for where we were at as a state to require that. And this is Anne. I'd just like to add, there's no evidence that uh, same-day access is going to get your patient better sooner. So it's great engagement. Uh, we do know in many rural areas, people would rather engage by phone than in person, for example. So again, uh, we've had employers contact that as well, uh, patients preferring phone uh, intervention and support over in person, um, particularly in rural areas. Uh, it's it's a wonderful to be able to offer that, but different size clinics, uh, 
uh, behavioral health providers busy with other things or off-site or they're shared. Um, it's just not feasible and no, but we've got no data, no studies that say um, it's going to get your patient better sooner. We do know from studies that early strong engagement, especially in those first month, first four weeks or so, is what is matters a lot. So um, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, so, Denny, another question for you. Um, so, we had a, a comment that um, the slides you went over provided some great practice guidelines for population health um, and also seemed generic and applicable to almost any chronic disease. Um, and so, the question is what things might you suggest would be unique to be unique to behavioral health where some coordination with specialists might be required? Yeah, well, well, I think that um, it is very similar. I think that the systems that would be in place that would help somebody with diabetes would also be the same systems that would help somebody um, with recurrent depression. Uh, and that once you sort of master one model that works for chronic disease, you can apply it to others. Um, but I would uh, again turn it over to Brian and Anne, who have uh, a lot of clinical experience and might be able to speak to some of the, the differences that they would recommend or that they've seen. So, so this is this is Brian. I think, I think, if you think about behavioral health integration only in terms of behavioral health concerns, I think you're really missing the boat. Um, and I think, for really looking towards, so for example. Um, the evidence shows that depression doesn't necessarily lead to higher ED utilization. In fact, in an internal study we did, we found the, the modal number of ED visits in our depressed patients was actually only one. Um, what you actually see is anxiety and other manifestations of physical health problems leading to higher ED utilization. But then when we look back at our data, 86% of those patients had a mental health condition. So what, what am I getting at here? Well, I think that if we're really starting to think about integration being something that we're striving towards, it has to be larger than behavioral health. It has to be more about thinking about the, the, the whole people that we're treating, understanding what impacts them, and then taking an integrated approach. And, and, and that being largely focused on helping people manage physical health manifestations of whatever it, it may be that they're presenting with. And doing some good care management across the system, um, and I and I don't think that I think that if we solely focus on behavioral health concerns, we're going to miss that boat. Great, thank you. So this um, next question, I'll ask any of our presenters um, to jump in here. This is a workforce question. Um, related to scope of practice and role um, for, uh, for professionals. Um, and the commenter here says that ultimately um, these approaches will change the base education that will be needed at all levels of health professions. So can our presenters offer some thoughts on what might be a base curriculum to teach at colleges and universities? that allows for the variation in the approaches that we've discussed today. And as a follow-up, are there existing work groups that are addressing um, curriculum uh, and licensure issues uh, related to, to the approaches we've discussed? Uh, this is Ann, let me start off. Uh, UW Medicine um, and our my colleague here at the AIMS Center, uh, Dr. Anurat Slip, we're working a lot, she particularly on is leading many efforts around um, doing a, a stronger job of preparing um, people who are in schools of social work, schools of nursing, elsewhere, um, to really enter uh, the workforce ready to work in integrated um, systems of care. Um, it's a bit of an uphill. We offer some uh, fellowship and other work um, you'll find on our website. Um, to help prepare um, ARNPs as well as psychiatrists for working um, in a more population-based way and using collaborative care strategies, for example. Um, but I think there's a there's a long slog ahead, frankly. Um, we really observe that people don't generally come out of uh, those those graduate programs 
ready to jump in in primary care. And a lot of the training we do is really helping people prepare for that, um, being part of a team, understanding the pace and busyness and activity that's going to be needed in either behavioral health settings or in primary care settings as well. So I do want to mention we're, uh, we're working with Qualys Health and others to develop a workshop January 9th um, to talk about and offer support for nurses who are working in expanded roles um, in whole person care. We're really excited about that. So look for announcements on that soon. Nurses are, are obviously a, a workforce we want to develop their skills um, across whole person continuum and in particularly in um, behavioral health areas. As many of us, I'm a nurse by training, didn't come out of nursing school ever expecting to be asked to do these things. So there's a lot of work there. Um, nurse care, management, care managers are also playing a large role in Washington State's uh, new opioid treatment networks, recently federally funded, and um, we're excited about working with them as well. Couple, couple things I, I want to jump in here. This is Brian. I, I mean, I think I want to acknowledge, and I'm sure Ann agrees with this, um, there, there's a gap there. And I think that, you know, it's important to call that out right now because I think the healthcare system is changing in such a way that, um, you know, the educational institutions are still trying to keep that keep up. But I think with that said, there are a couple of resources I would point people to if they're interested, particularly on the consultation side, um, there's some retraining um, doctor behavioral health programs through Arizona State University. Um, there are some programs from the University of Massachusetts that work on retraining. In terms of initial training, we're starting to see that come through um, some of the smaller professional schools um, and in terms of working in primary care and, and doing the work. Um, but I, I think that there are still needs at the ACH level that, that um, are, are real and realized. And I think we need to uh, begin to think about, um, and part of this might be thinking about the strategy that, that each clinic and ACH wants to approach. And then moving back to um, you know, the transformation hub and saying, these are the, our training needs, well, how can you help us? And, and then beginning to think about um, Qualys and others coming together to help um, train to those and, and engage partners as necessary. This is Joan. I'll just say one thing real quickly as well. Um, there are quite a few, you know, work groups around the state that are tackling this workforce issue that is, you know, a pretty significant um, issue, regardless of whether you're working in primary care or behavioral health. One of the things in terms of licensure that I think would be helpful is to make it a bit easier um, for clinicians to become duly licensed as a mental health professional and a chemical dependency professional um, to help address um, the substance abuse issues as well. And then I do want to draw your attention to um, some technical assistance and training that we have put together, the Washington Council along with the UW AIM Center and our National Council for Behavioral Health. We have developed a learning collaborative package and one of the things that we can help you with is to help consult and assist in um, defining or redefining your staffing models to help you develop a workflow and really to help you create this model that will work within the you know, confines of your agency and the staff that you have. Thanks, Joan. I was, I was going to punt to you if you didn't speak up. <laughs> Um, it, this is just really exciting for us. Um, uh, we're really excited about the council brought together um, some strong expertise on the Missouri Health Homes model, um, Joe Parks and others with the National Council, and we're all uh, we're going to be working together on this, and we're really excited about that opportunity. Um, the the resources you'll find on the, the link to the our web page about resources for Washington State. Um, you know, please feel free to email me or Sarah Barker with any questions. We recognize that the ACHs have a much broader uh, responsibility across um, uh, many medical as well as behavioral health conditions. So we've posed something, uh, a package of, of training and support for you that um, we're happy to help figure out how that might be adjusted to fit in with a larger learning collaborative approach, which incorporates um, 
other concerns other than behavioral health, um, we recognize the ACHs have quite a bit on their plate to um, work on in the next few years. So we wanted to make sure that we had something that could be flexible enough that might fit in appropriately on the primary care side. It's a little easier to, <laughs> for Joan uh, uh, and everybody at the Washington Council to work with us to um, mount a larger effort, I think, um, because that's going to be needed on that side of the coin. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a, just a few um, more fun flow type questions, but before um, I go ahead and address those, and I think this uh, follows up nicely to the last question and some of the responses. And again, for any of our uh, panelists who want to answer this, um, please jump in. Um, but uh, how might providers start to pre prepare themselves in assessing their capacity needs to support and connect to these different approaches. So if there's an interest, how do, how do they get started? How do they um, conduct that, that capacity assessment? So I can, I can take that one. This is Brian. Um, one of the things that uh, is coming through um, the Transformation Hub and Qualys uh, is a tool called the MEHAS. Um, and it's, an, it's a tool that basically assesses a variety of domains of behavioral health integration, including um, providing access and also care management approaches um, and kind of where you're at, again, if you're striving towards that optimal approach that, you know, not only provides behavioral health in the context of care, but also does some, some work around care management and psychiatry consultation. Um, well, I can uh, have that uh, be a follow-up email potentially that goes out to people if they're interested or can contact um, the organizers for the webinar. Um, it's the main health um, access foundation uh, tool. Um, and it gives you a really good score and kind of also helps you understand what are we doing right now um, well and where might be some areas for improvement. It really kind of puts you along that continuum and, and is a good place to start in evaluating, uh, you know, where the areas of improvement are um, and, and where you, optimally you want to go. This is Anne. I'll just add that um, both on our web page and on the Washington Council's um, Training and Technical Assistance page, you'll find a readiness, readiness checklist um, that uh, might be useful to uh, providers and organizations who uh, would like to sort of step back and look and say, okay, are we ready to make a major investment of staff time and administrative effort in training and uh, structure? Um, what are the what planning and do we need to have before we're ready to invest that time in training? So those are resources available to you. Um, we the AIM Center we first piloted this in New York State, frankly, because what we found um, in our larger learning collaborative is we had a number of providers there who just really weren't ready to take full advantage of um, the time out of clinic um, to really move forward effectively. That's why we had adapted more of a small group, practice group model there. And we encourage you to uh, really use that kind of checklist. I will say, if you've got the bandwidth to let a team start uh, piloting and PDSAing, that's great. We, you could, we've got tools like the Depression Tracker. We've made it very, very affordable, um, easy to download. We've got a free spreadsheet. Um, if you've got a team that you'd be willing to let do some um, work on their own to understand how well they're performing now, how much screening they're able to accomplish now, whether or not they're getting their patients now, um, I really encourage that kind of um, early involvement, um, whether or not you do that independently or working with us, um, and Qualys and others. So. Great, thank you. Um, and this is Kaylee, and I'll just add um, that workforce activities are really foundational to the, to all, all of the work for Medicaid transformation. And so um, I know the discussion today has been um, some fodder for our workforce partners that are listening in as well. Um, so for, for all of our listeners, um, that is um, a uh, major focus and a foundational element, um, and there will be um, a lot more information forthcoming on those workforce uh, activities and resources, um, so keep your eyes open um, over the coming months. 
Um, so um, there is a couple questions on uh, more specifically the incentives available through the demonstration um, and how providers should be thinking about the demonstration as, as that investment opportunity to support the development of their clinical capacity. And then there was a follow-up question about the timing of when uh, incentives are, are released to actually be able to be that, that, um, that investment uh, for the development work. And so what I would say um, is the first major milestone that triggers incentive payments is the submission and approval of the ACH project plans. And as we had discussed earlier, those plans are due on November 16th. And so based on the score um, and approval of those, uh, of those project plans, the first uh, major incentive payment, which is essentially all of the funds that have been allocated for the first year of the demonstration, would be distributed in early 2018 to the ACHs through our financial executor. And so those funds um, really are intended to then, um, according to each ACH's budget plan, significant uh, resources for partnering providers to really begin a lot of the, the work for the various project activities. And would encourage uh, that dialogue to happen at the Accountable Community of Health tables. Um, they are, are, are working on this, um, and that it will look a little bit different from, from one ACH to the next, but that uh, investment is then really intended to get you to the, to the next major milestone. Um, and so while it is, uh, in, incentives are earned once there's performance, but again, that performance in the beginning years of demonstration is more process-oriented um, and is, in, is a lot the way that they are earned allows that upfront investment to then continue um, to continue those activities. Um, and so hopefully that gets to the, to the timing question of, you know, yes, the funds for um, the fifth year of the demonstration, you don't technically earn those until after the performance, but hopefully you've used funds earned in the fourth year of the demonstration to get you to the fifth year. Um, of the demonstration, and then uh, that rationale applies um, for each year. So I don't know if there's any other questions that we've received, and I think we are about out of time. Um, so again, these slides and the recording of this webinar will be available on our website. Um, and I want to uh, thank all of our presenters uh, for joining us today and for all of you for listening in over the lunch hour today. Um, so if you um, need any uh, further information, there's some contact info here on this last slide. And if you are not already signed up with the Healthier Washington Feedback Network, please go ahead and sign up at hda.wa.gov um, forward slash Healthier Washington. All right, thank you. Thank you.